Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to morning worship service here at Calaveras Presbyterian Church. Welcome to our viewers on YouTube and to our members who are sitting out on the porch on this very warm October day. Glad that you're here worshiping God together with us today. Uh, I need to make some corrections on the bulletin. Um, getting really sloppy on this, apparently. First thing is the hymn of preparation. The uh, hymn title is correct, Be Thou My Vision, but the number is wrong. It's number 640. And then the uh, 642, yes, 640. That's what I got written, 642. Uh, then the uh, hymn of response following the sermon is not the one listed there. It's the one that's on the insert in your bulletin. That is the correct one. O church arise. And then as far as activities uh, today and uh, this coming week, uh, this afternoon, uh, we invite you to come back for a special about program presentation in support of Calabar's Door of Hope Pregnancy Center. The bulletin says the potluck meal starts at 5.30. It's actually the meal is going to start at 5 o'clock, and the video that will be presented will be at 5.30. So be here for the meal, a potluck banquet, if you will at uh, 5 o'clock, followed by the uh, video at 5.30, and be prepared to make a generous donation. This is a fundraising event. All that will be followed by our regular evening Bible study whenever all those activities are finished. We will be taking one, another look, uh, led by Elder Mose, uh, at uh, eschatology. So be here for the special Door of Hope presentation and then our Sunday evening Bible study. Uh, Reformation Day celebration at Oak Hill Church in Sonora on Saturday, October 31st, which is Reformation Day. Beginning at 2 p.m., uh, starting with a bunch of games, always a lot of fun. Uh, you can wear a costume if you want to, dress up like one of the reformers. <clears throat> I think, Doug, you would make a good uh, Wycliffe, maybe. With, uh... Okay, uh, there's a uh, very... Uh, fun time and uh, there will be a meal involved in that also. Please take a look at the chapel cleaning schedule and the snack schedule. We still need a volunteer for, not this week, but the following week. There's a sign-up sheet on the back if you add your name to that. Big doings on Friday. Those two people sitting there next to each other in the back of the room are actually going to get hitched. <laughs> so pray for them. A lot of preparations this coming week. Pray for all the, them and their family as they prepare for that. All right. Anything else that needs to be mentioned or corrected? Great. All right. Our hymn of the month is on the back of your bulletin. Uh, yet not I, but Christ through me.
Amazing sentiments to begin our time of worship together. Would you please rise for God's call to worship this morning, which comes to us in the words of Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that our strength is not in ourselves; that our strength is in you entirely. Father, we praise you that you are like a powerful and tender shepherd who at the same time protects us, and guides us and nurtures us as your lambs. Father, we ask that we would be nurtured by your spirit, that we would be covered with the blood and kingship of Jesus in this time of worship. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's greeting this morning, also from Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Please remain standing, and for a hymn of praise, 295, crown him with many crowns. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. 
Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is it's quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Well, we live in a time that is insanely politically charged, do we not? It is impossible to get away from politics. You will notice that that will even be a, a, a theme throughout today's time of worship. Because an election time is upon us. And this is a time of wheeling and dealing and power brokers and backroom deals and corrupt ballots and dirty politics and evil intent from many in our land. It is a time that tries men's souls. It is a time where the power of darkness is, is putting forth a very great effort. It's the greatest effort that I have at least seen in, in my lifetime in America and maybe the greatest in the history of our country. Unless we be overwhelmed by the spirit of the age, it is critical that we keep bringing ourselves and our children back to the perspective of God. And the psalmist tells us here that the, the present distress, which we often take uh, so personally, it's not about us, is it? It is at its core against the Lord and against his anointed, against his, his Christ. Let us break the bonds asunder. The bonds of the triune God asunder is the enemy's motivation. And then the psalmist, having said that, immediately brings us into the throne room and we see the mind of God. And he's not worried because how could he be? He laughs the enemy to derision. He scorns the enemy because Christ, who is the eternally begotten son, in other words, he is in essence, in pure essence, the almighty creator himself, and he's all seeing and he's all powerful and he's all sufficient and he's already sitting as the king <clears throat> and he's fully capable of squashing rebels, whole nations of them should he choose as easily, it says, as an iron bar could smash pottery. Think a baseball bat and a china teacup. The command to the kings of the earth is simple. Kiss the sun lest he swing that bat. And we can easily say then, yeah, do that. Biden, do that, Trump, do that, Governor Newsom. Except in this land, God has ordained it that they really aren't the leaders. You are the leaders. This is a land of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And your governor and your president and your congressmen, they are public servants. They are your servants. They are reflections of the people that they serve. America, you get the representative you deserve because they are just that. They are your representative and you choose them. Now, no decision is neutral, certainly not decisions who will be the civic minister of God in this land. No decision is outside of God's uh, commands from his holy law. For Christian and non-Christian alike, the command of our Lord this morning is that you be wise, wise in your election choices, wise in your personal choices, wise in all things secular and sacred, because no decisions are neutral and all decisions touch upon the sacred ultimately. What you do in this life does, in fact, echo in eternity. And so this passage enjoins us in this great season of uncertainty and difficulty that we face as a nation, that we are to serve the Lord in fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the sun, and be blessed as you take refuge in him alone. And as Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress, says, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. And I think because all of us are guilty in one degree or another of seeking salvation in our money or in our politics, in our own strength. And I think probably all of us at least are guilty of, of harboring at least some belief that if we just get the right people in office, everything will be fine. And uh, that is not the route to salvation. But important, as we will see throughout this service. But because this is how we act, we must come now before the Lord to ask his forgiveness and his guiding spirit as we confess our sins together. Please kneel as you are able. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we are a foolish people. We weary ourselves out by trying to walk by sight when you have called us to walk by faith. Um, Father, we often just cannot let go of our fears. We cannot let go of our reliance on our own metal 
on our own plans. Holy Spirit, all of our plans are in your hands. You turn them where you will. It is you whom we are told guide the king's heart like water. It is you who will either break forth in revival in this land or will punish us. Blessed and eternal son, it is you who will either revive us with your gospel or who will break us like a clay pot. And so, try in God, we confess our folly, our weakness before you now as a nation. We cast ourselves upon your mercy. We ask that in your great mercy you would forgive us, that you would spare us. Father, we confess the sins of our nation. We confess the sins of the American church as well, where we have refused to apply your law. Uh, we have refused to be the salt and the light that you have intended to call nations back to you. Father, this nation and her churches are made up of individuals like us, um, if our individual hearts are sinful, if they are rotten, our institutions will be rotten as well. Um, and we who claim your name will be but blasphemers. So we ask that you would hear now our personal confessions in this and other regards as we offer them before you now. Father, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We refuse to do so. Father, we throw ourselves upon your strength now. These things we pray in the blessed name of the King, the Savior, and the Bridegroom, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We would please rise for God's assurance of pardon, which comes also from Isaiah 40, out of verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. You have confessed your sins of reliance upon other saviors than the Lord Jesus Christ. You've confessed your personal sins and fears before him as well. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. He delights to call his sheep home. He delights to rescue his people to be your shepherd. And it is the promise of Jesus the shepherd that your sins are forgiven. And the true family of God may therefore joyfully say, thanks be to God. And joyfully sing in our hymn of thanksgiving, 693, Blessed Assurance.
may be seated. And take your hymnals and turn back to page 862. Keeping with our theme for today, we're looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 23 of the Civil Magistrate, and we will take a look at uh, section 3 right now, <clears throat> page 862 <clears throat> of the Civil Magistrate, section 3. People of God, what do you believe? Civil magistrates may not assume to themselves the administration of the word and sacraments, or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, or in the least interfere in matters of faith. Yet as nursing fathers, it is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the church of our common Lord, without giving the preference to any denominations of Christians above the rest in such a manner that all ecclesiastical persons, whatever, shall enjoy the full, free, and unquestioned liberty of discharging every part of their sacred functions without violence or danger. And as Jesus Christ hath appointed a regular government and discipline in his church, no law of any commonwealth should interfere with, let, or hinder the due exercise thereof among the voluntary members of any denomination of Christians, according to their own profession and belief. It is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the person and good name of all their people, in such an effectual manner as that no person be suffered, either upon pretense of religion or of infidelity, to offer any indignity, violence, abuse, or injury to any other person whatsoever, and to take order that all religious and ecclesiastical assemblies be held without molestation or disturbance. Let's come before our God now in our congregational prayer. Triune God and blessed Savior of our souls, our hearts overflow, our tongues are eager to praise the King this morning. We, Father, are so grateful that you are not the God imagined by the deists, that you did not create this amazing universe, wind it up, cause it to operate according to natural laws, and then just walk away and leave us to our own devices. No, Lord, you are sovereign over every molecule in this universe. Every molecule is cared for by you, upheld by you, guided according to your own purposes. And, Father, we praise you that they are glorious purposes. Father, you number the very hairs of our heads, we praise you for this. You sustain every heartbeat and every breath that we have. We praise you for this. We recognize your guiding hand, Father, in our lives. And though we do not always understand your purposes, we don't know why sometimes our children stray from the faith and walk in foolishness. We don't know why cancer or other crushing sicknesses sometimes strike your people. Well, it seems that those who do not name your name uh, go along prosperous and unharmed. Father, these are the secret things of your will. We recognize this. We ask that you would teach us contentment and a willingness to trust that these things are perfectly what we need to fit us for heaven. We thank you, Lord, that those things which Satan intends to be for our temptation and for our fall, you intend for our trial and for our success and for your glory. We praise you for these opportunities. But Father, though we do not know your secret will, we do know your precepts. We know your revealed will. We ask that you would make us faithful in following them, that you would give us delight in your law and a desire to uh, meditate on it day and night. And triune God, we also know your will of disposition as well, that you take no delight in the death of the wicked, that your delight is in recovering lost sheep, and we ask that you would do so today across our land. We ask that you would redeem this land, that you would save this land. We ask in particular that you would come to our lost family members, our beloved friends. We ask that you would regenerate and redeem their hearts, that you would use us as your witnesses in whatever fashion you deem best, as individuals, as a church. Father, we pray with our sister Lori Mara, uh, for Jessica, again, as we have frequently prayed, as she now sits in jail, struggling with her addictions and her mental confusions. Father, we ask that you would bring her to such a place where she casts aside uh, all that she relies upon and that she would instead turn to you. We ask that you would redeem her soul, that you would clear her mind, that you would clear her body. We pray, Lord, that you would 
uh, show her Jesus in a powerful way. And Father, we pray along with Kristen Nelson again for Katie as we have frequently uh, that as they continue to try to discover what this mystery uh, affliction is that is upon her. Um, we praise you for the procedures that happened this week. We just ask that you give uh, the physicians wisdom and that you as the great physician would touch this uh, young girl's body. Father, we uh, pray with Jen Hendricks, who many of us know, for her daughter, daughter Bailey Madison, who had the serious car accident this week, went into surgery, had a, many difficulties. We just praise you, Lord, that you spared her life and uh, that her uh, mother and family did not have to uh, deal with a, a great tragedy. But we ask, Lord, that this broken leg and ankle and knee would, would uh, uh, again, be a trial that draws her to you, not a temptation that drives her away from you. And Father, we pray along with the Cooksons for swift healing for Becky. I confess I did not follow up on what that illness was, but you know, Lord, we just pray with them that you would cause her to heal swiftly and for Doug's knee as well. Just pain relief for both of them, we ask. Father, we pray for our friends, the Choates, who many of us know and love uh, from the time over at, in Sonora as they have this guest with them, this individual who has been a victim of elder abuse. Um, we recognize, Lord, that the, the fear they have from this, I believe it was a nephew, um, and also just the, the health of this older gentleman. Father, we pray that you would spare his life, that you would uh, work through, with, through the court system and bring justice in this regard. We pray that you would be with the Choates, that you would uh, um, just give them peace of mind. And Father, we thank you with Steve Poulos for the praise report of... Uh, his, uh, his worker's wife, Miss um, Edris. Uh, we have prayed for her before, Lord Father. We just praise you for the great report that she is recovering from her surgery, that she is getting better, that she is returning to her family. We thank you, Lord, that you, again, are the God who does see down to the tiniest details you care for, for all of us. We uh, just praise you for uh, your evident working in this situation. And then, Father, we pray for, uh, along with Gail, for, for uh, Gail Johnson, for Bethany, as she has gone through this difficulty with an abusive husband and going through the, the court system as well, we ask that you would protect her, that you would protect that family um, from repercussions. Um, Father, you know the difficulty of that situation. We give you glory in advance. We praise you that you are the Lord of hosts, which means that you command great and powerful armies. You look over your children. We ask that you would send your protecting hand around that family. We thank you, Lord, for the many visitors that you have given us in uh, recent weeks. We pray your blessing upon their families. Pray your blessing upon uh, the desires of their heart. We, we pray, Lord, that you would come in a mighty way in your spirit and that you would help them deal with whatever difficulties they may have. Father, we praise you that we have the pleasure of seeing Wesley here among us again. Thank you for the safe drive from Los Angeles last night. Praise you for him and all that he means to this body, to this family. Father, we praise you for just the friendships and opportunities of discipleship that we have. We pray, Lord, that you would grow those bonds, that you would grow uh, beautiful friendships among our women, heroic friendships among our men. We pray, Father, that all of us would grow in, uh, in knowledge of you and in holiness. We thank you for these opportunities. And Father, we praise you when we speak of growing together in love. We praise you again for Ethan and Elise. We praise you for the marvelous time that is being had getting uh, the property ready for this blessed event. Um, we pray, Lord, that joy would reign supreme throughout this week, um, that everyone who gathers would, would be able to see an example of, uh, of what Christ does with the church, this, this uh, blessed union. Praise you for the strength that you have given, the spiritual strength that you have given these two. Praise you for the future that you have prepared for them. We ask that you would give strength to all those who are aiding in the preparation, we thank you, Lord, uh, for their self-sacrifice and their service. We thank you, Lord, for Ethan's passing of his uh, uh, test this week, his martial arts test, and for his uh, third degree now. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that will be to their business. And we just ask your blessing upon um, their marriage in every way. Father, we pray for all of our unmarried ones who are in this church. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of many children, many teens. We ask, Lord, that you would prepare... Uh, godly spouses for them as well. Father, we thank you for uh, this time of election as we, as we were looking at in the service. Father, we just thank you that there are still good and godly people across this country who desire um, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask, Lord, that you would 
uh, honor those requests. And Father, we thank you that you uh, give us um, warriors who will fight on our behalf, um, and that we recognize many flaws in our president. Father, we praise you that he has governed um, in, a, in a large measure, in very tangible ways, in, uh, in ways that protect your people. We praise you for this. We ask that you would come into his heart, that you would draw him closer to you. We thank you for uh, the, the good rallies that we have seen in this county and around um, in these previous weeks. We just ask your blessing upon our president in this season. And we ask that you would confound all candidates at any level who support abortion, who support de depravity um, of all types. Father, we ask that you would confound all movements of the system uh, that are away from your law, that are towards hatred. We ask instead, Father, that as we're coming up on a time of reformation, that you would bring a reformation upon your church and a revival upon this land. Father, we pray for Justice Barrett and her continued nomination. We hear, Lord, that a vote could come as early as Friday the 23rd. Um, we ask, Lord, that you would be honored in that decision and that if it be your will, she would take her seat on our Supreme Court. Father, we ask that you would use her wisdom and her knowledge and her love of you uh, to strike down unjust laws in this land. Father, we ask that you would open all of our churches and that you would empower our pastors and elders and deacons and parishioners to open their mouths and to speak the truth in witness to those who are around them. First and foremost, to the gospel, Lord, and then as they have done that and as they are leading people to you, that they would be faithful in applying the gospel to all walks of life. We uh, just praise you. We praise you for this church. We praise you for her faithful witness. We praise you for your blessing upon her finances. And now as we come to our uh, time of offering, we ask your continued blessing and that we would be wise in use of these funds for the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Please rise for our hymn of preparation. Elder Rose is very generous to say that he made the mistake. I sent him the wrong number. 642, <laughs> Be Thou My Vision. 642, Be Thou My Vision for our hymn of preparation.
Well, you may be seated. Except for you little ones, come on forward. Trickling in from the back there. Come on in. All right, just find any old spot. All right, so... We're coming to my favorite time of the year. We really are. I just love the fall. I love the fall. And I think part of the reason why I love the fall is not only because the weather's all changing and because we get to go to Apple Hill and things like that, but I love it just because there's all kinds of holidays that are coming up. There's Reformation Day and there's Thanksgiving and there's Christmas. Your birthday? Oh, yes. That's my real reason I love the fall. Yeah. Acadia's birthday, too. You guys have the same birthday, I think, right? Oh. Yes. You, too. Man, this is awesome. Well, what else is coming up? There's another season coming up. You've heard people talking. Reformation. Yeah, but there's something that comes up every four years. It's not as happy of a season always. Not winter. Yeah, winter comes up every four years around here too. Yeah, (laughs) right, right. Yeah, no, we're coming up on an election season, right? Do you hear your parents talking about an election? election? What's an election? Who knows what an election is? Noah, what's an election, buddy? Very good. You pick a president, you pick, you know, propositions in the land, you pick governors voting. Yep, that's what that's what election means. Okay, so but here's my question for you guys. Doesn't the Bible remind us again and again that we're citizens of heaven? Right? So what do we care about what happens down here in America? What do we care? What do you say? That is always the best answer to any question that you get asked. Yes. Right, no. Well, uh, give me a, a, a easier question. Do you care what the situation is like in your household? Do you care if, you no, know, wait, you don't care what it's like? I care about Jesus. You care about Jesus. Very good, young man. Right. So we care what things are like in our household. We care if things are safe, if there's enough, if there's enough money for food to be on the table, right? You care for all those things. If, if it's a safe environment, if your family loves each other. And we care what happens in our churches, Right. We want to make sure that our churches, I like your smile, that's great. Um, what, what happens in our churches and if it's safe and just if God's word is being complained, uh, complained, proclaimed, not complained. <laughs> Please, hopefully you're not being complained. But, um, but in the Bible, are there people who care what happens in their land? Can you think of any characters in the Bible who really cared what happened in their land? Moses very much cared what happened in the land. David, King David did. Joseph did. Who cared what happened in the land of Babylon? There's a real famous one there. Yeah, but which, which Christian was in there? That was Daniel. Daniel, is that what you're going to say? Very good. you got lots of answers, buddy. Um, uh, Queen Esther, for you ladies, right? She cared what was happening in her land. Right. We care if our land is honoring to God, just like we care if our homes are, just like you care if our churches are. Because why? What is a safe and free land make possible. Wait, Noah? No, what, 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 is, for all of you guys, what does a safe and a free land, what is it, is it easy or hard to share the gospel if someone isn't trying to kill you every time you talk about Jesus? Easy. It's easy if they're not trying to kill you, right? Right, if we have a nice, free and safe land, it's, it's free, and it's honoring to God if our, if our, our land um, is honoring to God, right? And Christians can be protective, Bethlehem was a town in Israel, you know? But, but even, even like Abraham, you remember in the Bible, remember those wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. Abraham even prayed for those cities. He kind of was interceding on their behalf, not necessarily because he thought those cities were wicked and should, you know, weren't wicked and shouldn't be wiped out, but he was doing it for protection for God's people, right? So he even cared um, in that sort of, of a place. So the question is, you can't vote yet, right, Aaron? Not yet? So what can you do? Your parents are going to vote. They're going to vote for what they think are just laws and godly laws. But what can you guys do? I mean, historically, have American children been able to do anything? Yes. You know, sometimes in the Revolutionary War, I was just telling Gabriel about this, some of the things in the Revolutionary War. Um, 
our later, one of our presidents later, Andrew Jackson, he was miles his age in the war, and he acted as a courier, and the British soldiers caught him, and they, and they said, he said, shine my boots, you rebel, you rebel scum, and he wouldn't do it, and so they beat him up, and he was scarred even for his life for that. It's like, actually, I wrote a couple other ones down here that I thought were interesting, too. Thomas Young, he was 12 years old. He became a major in the, in the army and was instrumental in winning some battles. He was 12 years old, right? James Armour said he was born a slave. He was Acadia's age, and he, gave, he, was a, he was a born a slave who became one of Washington's spies, and he um, actually gave the information that won the Battle of Yorktown. And, and, and you've ever heard a guy named Lafayette? He was like the French general who helped us. Yeah, guess how old he was? I didn't know this until I looked this up. He was 18 years old. It's crazy what these guys were. There was a little girl named Sybil Ludington who rode her horse 40 miles. She was like, she was probably Felicity's age, like 40 miles and saved a whole bunch of people warning of an attack. It was pretty crazy what they could do. So you guys, I don't know if you're going to like do something grand like that when you're 12 years old, right? But what could you do right now? Really important, because this is a really important election. Vote for a better president. Well, you can't vote yet, but, well, you could, there's ballots floating everywhere. You could vote against it. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? Pray to God. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Perfect. You guys could pray. Jesus says the faith of children, it's just so powerful. He's, he you, uses your faith as examples for everybody else. He says, little children just believe so easily. Your prayers are really powerful. If you prayed, if you prayed that the people in this land would repent and that we would have good and godly leaders, that would be awesome. Do you think you can do that? Yes. Do you have something to say, buddy? Or you just want to shake my hand? <laughs> All right, just stretching. Okay, good, you guys. Can you do that for me? Can you guys pray and then pay attention to the sermon? Because we're going to talk about, um, about the need to uh, work as Christians in our land. Good? All right, back to your seats. Yeah, James Madison, who was the, the, the father of our Constitution, the guy who wrote the Constitution, he was Sarah Beecham's age when he did that. He was 25 years old. Isn't that crazy? That was, that was a different time. That's true. That's true. Ambassador to Russia at 14 years old. Yeah, crazy, crazy. Well, let's turn to Acts 16, continue forward in our study in Acts we're looking at verses 35 through 40 today. Acts 16, verses 35 through 40. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that it is sufficient to all of our needs, to all of our times. We pray, Father, that as we look at this brief five-verse passage, that you would help us to glean truths out of it, that we may apply to our lives, to our nation. We uh, give you the glory in this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I uh, would crave your added prayers this morning because I'm entering into, for me, what I would consider to be uh, dangerous grounds for me personally. And as you know, if you're one of my Facebook friends, I'm a highly political person with um, what could be classified as strong opinions on American civil policy. I'm looking out at some people who are shaking their heads because they know they're exactly like that as well, right? But at the same time, if you've been attending CPC since our inception, you've heard me many times rail against um, something that I consider to be a very great sin in America. It's a sin that my son Gabriel has coined the phrase patrianity to describe. 
Patriarchy would describe an approach to the faith of our fathers that forgets the call and the goal of Christianity is the advancement of the kingdom of God, and it's the elevation of King Jesus. It's not the advancement of America. It's not the advancement of King democracy. Patriarchy is what you witness when a politician stands before you, whom you know to be a reprobate, who advances godless cause after godless cause, who espouses Marxist or libertine philosophy, who promotes abortion or sexual confusion and deviancy, but they stand before you and they close their speech with, God bless America, right? Puke, right? <laughs> Patriarchy today, it knows no party boundary, and it's characterized by individuals of either party using the gospel of Christ to advance the institutions of men rather than the other way around using the providential gifts given us by God in our government and our civic structure in service to the gospel, which I believe is what we see Paul doing in our passage today. And this topic, like I said, is a, is a, is a dangerous ground for me because I'm an unabashed constitutionalist, I'm a patriot, whose greatest fear as an under-shepherd of Jesus is that I would be motivated by my personal beliefs and passions and read into Christ's holy word teachings that are not there. So pray for me this morning that I'd be faithful to this text, um, because what I'd like to deliver is something of, a, of an artillery sermon in advance of the election. And if artillery sermon is a, is a uh, term that you're unfamiliar with, our artillery sermons were pre-election and pre-battle sermons that for about 250 years in our history, pastors regularly delivered. 150 years before the Declaration of Independence, at least 100 years afterwards, it was very regular before an election for a pastor to deliver an artillery sermon. The founding father clergy of this nation took very seriously Paul's injunction in Colossians 2, 8 through 11, which I'll read for you. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority." the time of the Declaration of Independence, there was near 100% literacy in the colonies, regardless of your social status. And historians credit this fact to the education and the principles of the Bible that were faithfully proclaimed from pulpits Sunday after Sunday. But Americans weren't just literate in the sense that they could read. They were, the average man or woman was highly literate in history, law, philosophy, politics, government, because Pastors were relentless in their application of the scriptures to all walks of life. Oftentimes, we can, uh, we can read back in the records, lawmakers would go out of, the, out of the sermon and immediately craft a law based on the knowledge they had just gleaned in the, in, the, in the sermon. In fact, as they were arguing over the law in the state house, they would frequently call the pastor in and say, what point did you make on Sunday? And they would like, uh, yeah, and they would, that's how they would craft the laws on the proposed legislation there. And signer of the Declaration of Independence and president of Princeton, the Reverend John Witherspoon, um, who, wrote, who delivered many such artillery sermons and personally discipled many leaders, President Madison, the architect of the Constitution, he discipled a vice president, three Supreme Court justices, 10 cabinet members, 12 governors, 21 senators, and 39 congressmen, plus many of the members of the Constitutional Convention. He was a famous preacher of artillery sermons, and he had this to say in, what's, in one such sermon in May of 1776, so right before July 4th. This was entitled, The Dominion of Providence Over the Affairs of Men. I just want to read a, one paragraph out of it. Upon the whole, I beseech you to make a wise improvement of the present threatening aspect of public affairs, and to remember that your duty to God, to your country, to your families, and to yourselves is the same. True religion is nothing else but an inward temper and outward conduct suited to your state and circumstances in providence at any time. And as peace with God and conformity to him adds to the sweetness of created comforts while we possess them, so in times of difficulty and trial, it is in the man of piety and inward principle that we may expect to find the uncorrupted patriot, the useful citizen, and the invincible soldier. God grant that in America true religion and civil liberty may be inseparable." And Witherspoon, whose influence over America cannot be overstated, what he's saying here is that the inner peace brought by conformity to Christ and to his holy word, 
That is the heart of true patriotism. That is the heart of wisdom in your decisions as a citizen. That is the heart of courage found in an invincible soldiery, is what his words were here. And this is not patriotity. This is the exact opposite, in fact. It is a declaration that Jesus is king above all earthly kings, and that his kingdom is to be a present reality. He is the Lord of all things, including our politics. And in Family Devotions this week, we just read in John 1, and I was, it's, it's stuck out to me very hard. I'm going to read a couple of verses out of this. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be complained that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the King, this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Jesus is the King. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, the, denying that is the spirit of the Antichrist. And any politician who would deny this by word and deed is himself or herself, of the Antichrist. He is a man or woman of lawlessness. And what we have happening here in Acts 16 is lawlessness. And Paul, as a Christian, and as a citizen of heaven and of Rome, will have none of it. Verse 35. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, and you can just get the flavor of his speech of his language here. They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. So the magistrates, they send their armed forces to intimidate and run the apostles out of town. And our newly converted jailer, who's not yet learned the ropes of how true authority works, he, um, he delivers the message. He tries to get them just be calm and leave the city, leave in peace. Clearly, these men are authority. They have swords strapped to their side. They come from the magistrates in robe. Go quietly, don't make a fuss. That's what the jailer delivers to them. And Paul will have none of it. And just so you know, Paul is not referencing some long-standing tradition of Roman citizenship. He's actually playing quite a masterful stroke of political theater here, which is why the rulers are so terrified. I'm sure, no doubt, you have heard of Cicero, the great Roman orator and statesman. Well, Cicero, when he was a, a young lawyer just cutting his teeth, he gained fame and respect for himself because of one particular case. He brilliantly prosecuted a wealthy, aristocratic colonial governor and proconsul whose name was Gaius Verus. Verus had played the Roman democratic scene uh, very well. He had used his friends and his family and his wealth and his connections. Um, and had bought his way to power. And along with that rise, he had become a man of entitlement and self-pleasure and brutality. He was, if I was looking back in history, just looking at him, he's very much, and I'm not trying to score political points here, he very much is a man like our own governor, who rules by fiat and um, by systematic ruthlessness. At the height of his lawlessness, he had a man who was trying to blow the whistle and tell the world of the corruption of this Varus. He had this man flogged and tortured and crucified, executed by crucifixion. Well, the brave man protested over and over, right up until his death, the simple words, Kivis Romanus Sum, I am a Roman citizen. I am a Roman citizen. I am a Roman citizen. And though Cicero was a young, inexperienced lawyer, and Varus was a wealthy and connected aristocrat, Cicero burned with indignation at this, and he went to political war over this, and he took down Varus, and Varus was ultimately executed by Mark Antony. And this was big news in Rome. This was international news, actually. And Paul was a highly educated lawyer himself, which people knew. And his statement, I am a Roman citizen, would have struck terror into the hearts of these magistrates. You had a colonial government governor that had abused a Roman citizen and had been executed, and now it was happening again. <clears throat> And here's a point, therefore, that I think we can make from this passage, and this may be an answer to those who do not see the world of politics and law as a proper sphere for the Christian. This may be an answer to the 
as I understand, some 54 million evangelicals who sit out of elections or vote on the wrong side. Paul was given mighty gifts by Jesus. He was given the political actions of Cicero. He himself was given brilliance, education, rhetoric, uh, the spirit of God, and he was given pagan citizenship. And Paul delights to use all of these gifts in service to the kingdom. This pushback from the apostles comes not because they are belligerent and not just because they can and not because they're vindictive, but, but because they're putting themselves on the line for the Philippian church and the progress of the gospel in Philippi. Verse 38, the police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So I love this. The, the political pressure worked immediately and the wicked magistrates backed down, but they still had the gall to come to the apostles and ask them to leave the city. Verse 40, so they went out of the prison and left the city. No, that's not what it says. So they went out of the prison and they visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them. And then they departed. And I think this is an important point. They didn't turn tail and run. They went right back to the gospel activities that they were doing when they were arrested and when they were beaten. Brothers and sisters, it is vital that citizens of the kingdom not give an inch to those who hate the kingdom. It is the spirit of the Antichrist that denies King Jesus. And what communion do we have with that spirit? We may not listen to that spirit. Had Paul and Silas not taken the respect and fear given them at this highly visible moment in a city, if you remember, that was full of fanatics and just quietly gotten out of Dodge with their skin intact, what do you think would have happened to those dear women who were gathering down by the river or to this jailer and his wife and his children as they tried to live out their faith as believers? <laughs> These were not spiritually muscular Christians in Philippi. They were infants in the faith. But Paul and Silas, who by God's providence were men of great spiritual power and wisdom and authority, they were sent for just a time as this to raise up this church and to be a shield to them while they were still babies. And people of God, we are surrounded by spiritual babies in our land. Church after church is barely hanging on due to compromise or cowardice or sometimes just because they don't know what they don't know. It is a modern legacy of false theology a legacy of historical and spiritual forgetfulness, a legacy that is not what was handed to us by our Puritan fathers. The German church's capitulation to the Nazis in the 1930s represented a similar failure. By not denouncing Hitler explicitly, denouncing his antichrist ideology, pastors failed to shepherd their churches during a time when faithful Christian discipleship was what was most needed. America's churches must wake up because the Lord is about to remove our lampstand from, from before his presence if we won't. And you've been placed in this world for just such a time as this. You have been placed as a shield before the forces of hell, which is an uncomfortable place to be because shields get hacked a lot. Men like John MacArthur are proving this daily as they use the political and civil gifts that God has given them to protect those who need to hear the gospel in these times that try men's souls. I think this is why Paul and Silas go back to Lydia's house pointedly after being told to leave. They are taking their position and they're saying, transferring it. These are our friends, right? Their bold actions and their words were what encouraged the brothers and sisters. And I want to encourage any pastors and elders and deacons who may be listening to this sermon here or online because I know there are some that do this. It is time for you once again to become the black robed regiment as the American pastors were known in the English parliament in the time of the revolution. It was the pastors who were blamed by the British for igniting, igniting the fire of independence that swept across the colonies. And as a result, the British army burned many churches during the American Revolutionary War. And sometimes the Black Robe Regiment even became more than just a theological foundation for American liberty. I told the story a few months ago of uh, um, uh, Reverend John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg um, who removed his pulpit robe to reveal the uniform of a full colonel. And he marched out of his church with 300 parishioners who joined the Continental Army as the 8th Virginia Brigade. It is radical in this day and age to think of our faith in these regards. This does not fit the idol of the 1970s gentle hippie Jesus with his flowing hair, 
that is falsely worshiped around our nation. Christians who serve the true king are called above all men and women to a holy courage in defense of those who are weak. Proverbs 24, 11 through 12, rescue those who are being taken away to death, hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay a man according to his work? There are reasons that it is right and fitting that we as Christians stand in the gap in the civil realm. And for the rest of this message, I want to lay some of them before you, four of them actually. And the first is this, if you're, if you're taking notes. First, God has granted us authority. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then with this in mind, if you read Luke 10, 19, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. All authority belongs to God, but in his divine economy, he has placed us in that chain of authority as stewards of this earth. We see that all the way back in Genesis 1:26. Genesis we're made in his image. We're given dominion. And because there is this great causal chain of authority that leads back to God, the scripture is, of course, full of verses warning us against rebellion. We had a sermon on this many months ago. There's a difference between being a rebel Christian, those are mutually exclusive terms, and being a revolutionary or a reformational Christian who seeks a return to legitimate biblical authority. God establishes authority, and we must obey his chain of command as we would obey, obey him, because rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, Samuel told Saul. But when an authority steps outside of their authority boundaries, as they have been prescribed by God, as these magistrates did here in Philippi, as Pharaoh did in the murder of the babies, as the Sanhedrin did in Acts 4, as our own government has done time and time again, it is the duty, it is the God-given authority of the Christian to say no further, we will have none of it, and to call the civil authority back to righteous authority. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? It is only the heart that is illuminated by the Holy Spirit that has the capacity for truth and judgment. Christian, of all men and women, are the ones gifted to structure civil society. And our founding fathers knew this. Founding Father John Jay, who was our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, declared, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Chief Justice Jay knew the truth of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Christian, you are called to stand in the gap because you are given the authority as the regenerated and spirit-filled representatives of the king. You know the truth. It has set you free. You are to use it to set other free, others free, spiritually and physically, because we are created as spiritual and physical beings. Point two, Christian, you must also stand in the gap for America because Christians are called to stand against evil. In Matthew 16, Jesus tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And as you undoubtedly knows before, gates are a defensive posture. The picture is not of Christians behind their church walls getting beat back into not singing and being socially distanced. The church is to be out in the world and on the offensive. It is the gates of hell where the battle rages, which means hell is being assaulted like the beaches at Normandy. It is Satan who was put on the defensive at the cross. His tyranny was broken as King Jesus shattered his power forever. He is the rebel on the run, and the spirit-filled hosts of Jesus are called as a spiritual army, walking in the power of Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, to do this. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I... Recognizing that, as we will sing in our hymn of response after the sermon, there is a mode to this warfare. I'm going to just, one of the verses we'll sing, a beautiful verse. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lie. An army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. 
are called to war to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. It's love. It's the word of God. That is how we rage against the captor. Christian, you are called to stand in the gap and to rescue children being slaughtered in abortions. You are called to rescue those being sold by sex traffickers. You are called to rescue those whose minds are being led captive by lies and misinformation and false statism. In the 20th century, atheistic and secular humanistic leaders gained controls, control of nations all across Europe, Asia, and Africa. And what was the result? Not including deaths by abortions, there have been almost 170 million men, women, children who've been shot, beaten, tortured, knifed, burned, starved, frozen, crushed, worked to death, buried alive, drowned, hung, bombed, or killed by these governments. Rescue the wicked and stand in the gap. We need to be spirit-filled intercessors in prayer for this nation, and we need to speak for the least among us in our votes, in our Facebook posts, in our conversations and work, and in our behavior. If you claim to be a Christian, then you must, as a citizen of heaven, live like one as a citizen of America, and this includes in your civic duties. Three, we must stand in the gap because we're called to be salt and light. We're called to be a preservative, and we're called to be a lamp to show people how to not stumble. We can't forget the words of Reverend Witherspoon, quote at the beginning of this message, it is not a top-down political patriotic that will redeem this land. It is not the imposition of human law that will give us peace. It is only the gospel of the king, regenerating the heart by the power of the Holy Spirit that has the power to transform the heart and cause a mind to see and desire to walk in the kingdom. It is only the law written on the heart that can restrain a society. It is only the word of God. Yeah. Founding father and Christian John Adams, our second president, declared, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Now, how do we get this faith? Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. And this, if you remember, comes directly on the heels of Paul saying, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. As the Christian family that is sitting here today, it is your witness to the world around you that God delights to use as his instrumental means to bring individuals and nations to faith in Christ. And why does he use such imperfect vessels? I have no idea. But he does. Our best works are at best unprofitable. They're scribbles presented to our daddy. I was giving that analogy to the high schoolers this week that, you know, I got a, I got a, I get paintings, a little picture for my kids all the time. I got one this last week. It was beautiful. It was a little stick figure with a beard, right? <laughs> and it was such a delight. And I just come by and just say, that was so great. I love this. Right? It's stick figure with a beard, which will develop into great art, I'm sure, eventually. Right? But that's what God does to us. We, we have these imperfect works that we do. He doesn't need them. And he delights to come alongside and put his arm around and say, what an awesome stick figure, right? It's, it's incredible. He calls us such imperfect vessels. He is, calls us to handle his word and be the instrumental means of finding the rest of the family members. And then again to handle the word and construct a society where his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We are not sufficient for the task of salt and light. But praise God, he is. But we are watchmen, placed on the walls of a city set on a hill to warn and to protect. And then point four, finally, we are called to stand in the gap as an example for generations to come. Because remember what God says in Malachi, what he desires. He desires godly offspring. We serve a, a covenantal God. We serve a generational God who makes promises to the children children of godly believers. We serve the father of our family. We serve the king of our country. We serve the spirit of both the father and the king. And we have a responsibility to this family, and we have a responsibility to our children. Romans 12, 
1 through 21, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of, one of another. And there's so much that we need to repent of. Every one of us in this room, as well as every Christian in this land, the American church has allowed her children to be caught by the spirit of the age. Rod Dreher in his newest book, Live Not By Lies, says this, the ideal subject of a totalitarian state is someone who has learned to love Big Brother. Back in the Soviet era, totalitarianism demanded love for the party, and compliance with the party's demands was enforced by the state. Today's totalitarianism demands allegiance to a set of progressive beliefs, many which are inco incompatible with logic and certainly with Christianity. Compliance is forced less by the state than by elites who form public opinion and by private corporate corporations that, thanks to technology, control our lives far more than we would like to admit. Today in our societies, dissenters from the woke party line find their businesses, careers, and reputations destroyed. They are pushed out of the public square, stigmatized, canceled, and demonized as racists, sexists, homophobes, and the like. And they are afraid to resist because they are confident that no one will join with them or defend them. Brothers and sisters, the American church has given its children over to this spirit of the age and taught them to love it. Not, not much has depressed me in 2020, but this fact as that young men and women who I have known from their infancy, some of them I've taught violin to, um, I see them on Facebook totally bought into the lies of the, of the left. Totally, 100%. Compromised worldview, compromised life view, life view, their janissaries come to slaughter the very historical parents who gave them birth. We see this in the line of questioning that comes at Justice Barrett. We see this marching through the streets of places like Portland. American parents, we have failed our children. We have given them over to be catechized by the evil one. And this is a sign of the depravity and laziness of our own hearts. We do this in many, many ways. I'm guilty of it myself. What I allow into my house through that television is to my everlasting shame. This is a very great sin that we must repent of. And as we close, one further thing that we particularly need to repent of in these days, the sin of cynicism. As he emerged from a meeting of the Constitutional Convention, a woman famously asked Ben Franklin, Mr. Franklin, what sort of government have you given us? And Franklin's reply, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Well, November 3rd, 2020, may decide once and for all if we can. And I pray that we can. But if we can't, the fault is not with the pagans. Pagans will do what pagans will do. Leopards can't change their spots. The fault will be with the Christians, whose apathy and cynicism and gospel faithlessness and refusal to do the hard but blessed work of shepherding their children will have lost the day. The spirit of the Antichrist is that which says Jesus is not king. And America will only see a reversal of her fortunes if the people of God stop listening to that spirit and instead repent and bow the knee before our sovereign one. And if she will, the foundations which are so cracked may yet be repaired. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have already had our confession of faith today, and yet I feel the need again to come before you and confess the sins of America. Confess all of our sins, Father. These, these last points here, we are so guilty of letting the spirit of this age come into the minds and hearts of our children. We ask, Father, that you would cleanse us of this sin. We pray, Lord, that you would even, in this ninth hour, that you would awaken your people. We pray, Lord, that your uh, mercy would shine down upon our nation, that you would give us uh, one last chance to repent. We are thankful whatever happens. We are thankful, Lord, if you decide instead to break us with a rod of iron, 
But Father, we ask even in that circumstance that we as Christians would be faithful in our proclamation of the gospel and of King Jesus for his kingdom is without end and it ever grows, it ever expands. We praise you for this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you take your hymnals and stand for our hymn of response, O Church Arise. charge for today. There are many points we can glean from our passage today, but I want to focus in on one that was made for our charge. And this may be an answer again to the world, to the, to those who do not see the world of politics and law as a proper sphere for the Christian. Paul was given mighty gifts by Jesus. He was given that brilliance, that education, that rhetorical skill. He was given the Holy Spirit. And like I said, he was given pagan citizenship. And he delighted to use those gifts in the service of the kingdom. And keep this in mind this election season. Surely one of the most important, perhaps the most important in the history of our nation. God has given you gifts, my Christian family. He has given you his word and his spirit that you might discern the truth of the issues facing us and that you might discern the truth of the candidates' track records. He has given you a constitution written by men who loved him and loved his law. He has given you the right to vote, and he has the free, given you the freedom to go vote. And he is a God who demands truth, and this includes truth at the ballot box. And he will not be mocked by those who claim to be Christian, but to re, but refuse to have their political choices reflect the law of King Jesus. Your charge then is to go and vote like a Christian, in a way that will best bring the will of heaven to bear on earth, to do otherwise is grievous sin, and God will not be mocked. God's benediction comes in the words of Isaiah 55, 12 through 13. 
For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all of the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. 